our ancestors made sense of reality by telling each other stories of their gods. This is our attempt to bring those tales back to life. My brother is the skies above you. My sister is the earth beneath your feet. And I, I am the waters. I am the ocean itself. I am one of the ancient primordials. I have watched as the young son of my siblings, Kronos, took the power from his father. How he cut his potency from him and left him the empty blue shell that now rests on Atlas's shoulders. It is the way of the world. The young overtake the old. But we are eternal. We are the world. We are the pieces of it. We are the powers. Without us, there is nothing. Kronos had his kingdom, had his power, and squandered it. A cruel and callous king for many eons. But the Lord of Time did not know when his was up. Now his own sons, the new youth, have taken his power from him. He and all his court are now trapped, banished to the clutches of my brother, Tartarus, and his realm beneath Gaia, the Earth, and even beyond Hades, the Underworld. No matter. Through it all I have remained. Okeanus and Tethys may rule the inhabitants of the waters for now, but they too are old, and the new has come. They worry as a young god has been promised their throne. They fret over how and when he will take it. But I care not, for I am the water itself. The waters do not concern themselves with when and how the fish live and die, only that they are free to do so. I do not involve myself in such matters, unless it were to affect all life in my domain. And I am not alone. For I have Thalassa. Together we are merged and intermingled. We are inseparable from one another. And as one, we make up all the oceans of this world. Our children are the hordes of different scaled creatures. For each fish is our child. The Setia, the whales, and sharks amongst them. We hold them all dear, for without us, they cannot survive. But their lives are theirs to live. Each choice and each mistake, we do not interfere. Thalassa is mother to a young sea nymph alone, Halia. She spends her days with daughters of Nereus, laughing with her favorite companion, Harley, the ox-eyed, delighted with names so close they feel like twins. But she is the lasses alone. I could not object, for I have many children without her. It is only right she have one of her own to dote on. For before we were united, in the dawn of the universe, the earth and I coupled to create children of our own. They are not as powerful as the great titans, but our children are not to be forgotten. Among the Oceanids, a young Eurybia thrived, and she was chosen to wife the titan Creus, the titan of heavenly constellations. Together they bore Astraeus of the Dusk, Pallas of Warcraft, and Perseus of Destruction, instrumental weapons in the war of the Titans and Olympians, as were their wives and children. Pallas fought for the old king, Styx for the new, 
taking their children, Zelos, Veer, Kratos, and Nike with her, tearing our family into even more divides with dire consequence. Perseus and Astraea had but one child, Hecate, goddess of witchcraft, magic, and boundaries. My granddaughter refused to participate in the war. Her time was not yet come, and she would not let it be cut short by them. And last, Astraeus and his wife Eos bore the four Animoi of the winds and the five Astra Planata, the wandering stars and planets. They stayed far away from us all when the fighting began. A wise decision indeed. One who did not share their fate is my son with Gaia. Aegeon, our son of storms, with his matching temperament. He commanded some elements of the armies of Kronos, like he did the great winds above my seas. But now, he is sealed with the rest of the Titans, in Tartarus. My next son with Gaia took no side, for Nereus, the old man of the sea, is the oldest of our children. He is trustworthy and gentle. He knows what is righteous and chooses to be kind above all. His daughters rely upon him to guide them, and he protects his family above all else. Nereus had no doubt of the outcome of the war, and that his participation would change nothing, for he had seen it all. Blessed with prophecy, he knew the tyrant would stand no longer. He simply smiled and stayed in the seas. Our second son, Thormus, is an aquatic god. He is the wonders of the sea. He and an oceanid Electra, together they have their own children. Iris, the minor goddess of rainbows, sent to be a messenger for the new gods of Olympus to show goodwill to the new rulers. Arche, her sister, who flew to the Titans when the banners were first risen. She served the old king and was punished for her crime. Arche, my granddaughter, had her wings torn from her and was doomed or so to Tartarus, as the rest of the foes were. The last of Thormus's children are the Harpii, the Harpies. Occipity and Aero among them. They still have their wings, soaring the skies of their great uncle. The last of my children with Gaia are our son Porsis, the lord of the barren brine. His body is like his temperament, a hard shell impossible to break through. He is different to his siblings. Where they swim and live together in the light, he scuttles in the shadows. With claw-like hands and extra limbs, they mock him. He is not beautiful, but he is strong. His crab-like shell protects him, but his heart can be soft so he hides away in the deep caves, carrying a torch in his extra arm to light the darkness. Our daughter, Sito, is with him. She comforts him together in their home at the lowest depths of the seas. She is an outcast with Porses. Where he is monstrous of body, she is of mind. A perfect pair, and a necessary balance. A calm, peaceful day must be balanced with a storm. The waters have friends and foes, for this is the balance of the universe. There is always a bigger fish in the sea. She is the darkness of our children, a mother to many monsters of myth to come. Their children are called the Posseids. 
They are the sisters, Enyo, Pefredo, and Dino. The hidden dangers of our sea, the grey ones, the greya. They stumble about, for they share but one eye and one tooth. Sharing and passing them between the three bodies, they have patience and secrets that must not be told. Existing quite happily just as three in a dark cave, they stay away from all, hidden, as they reveal their sisters, whom they promise to protect. For only the Grey Ones know where they reside, and vow to keep them safe. I speak, of course, of the Gorgons, Uriale, Stino, and the Venerable Medusa. They place the jagged rocks which ships will one day fear. They shall have hate called with their names, cursed by sailors and seamen alike, as they blame the sisters for their sinking ships, and not the navigators on board. And the sisters hide away, not to scare the creatures they share this home with. Uralie and Stino, protecting the youngest of them, but not well enough. Ladon is the youngest of their children, a serpent-like dragon, known as a terrifying creature, yet vigilant, destined to guard the most sacred of things, for power cannot fall into the hands of just any. There are those that could use power beyond their understanding to do things of such consequence it could destroy the balance of everything we know. With rest so great, these creatures are a necessity. What would happen if they did not? I pray we shall never know. We come not to the youngest, and certainly not the least, their daughter, Echidna. She stays in the depths with her close kindred, hidden in the deepest caves far from mortals and immortals alike. Her serpentine tail, differing from the strange beauty of her face, half her body a baiting, tempting mirage. It draws you in so that her tails and monstrous claws can snap you up. The godly beauty blinding, but the nature of the creature is that of its ilk. It kills and claws and maims, but she has a greater role yet to play, for her counterpart is calming, I have been told by my son. Nereus, with his prophetic sight, can see what their union will bring. Colossal creatures, beasts and behemoths, they will be mighty. The power of gods, still evident in their veins, they will be necessary. They are needed. For heroes to exist, there must be villains. Such is the way of our world. They will haunt the stories to come. But their tales are for another time. Living Mythology is our attempt to bring the stories of our ancestors back to life. They explained their universe through the medium of their religions. Their gods were not distant beings of academic study. They were living, breathing entities that reflected the wants, needs, good and evil in the very heart of humanity. We only wish to encourage others to study the deep and rich cultures of our forebears. We hope you have enjoyed our labors. If so, then do consider liking and subscribing. If you wish to support improvement in our endeavor, then we do have a patron as well. Until next time, be good to all, but most especially yourself.